Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. The meet was very nearby. I'm from TU Wien, which is half an hour from here at Karlsplatz. And I will present you some work that is related to black body radiation and the so-called wild law in disordered media. Now the story I'm going to tell you starts with the history of musical instruments. As you know, uh, people have known how to build elaborate musical instruments like organ pipes for a very, very long time without actually understanding the physics of it. But in the 19th century, there were very clever people who studied such problems from a physical point of view, and there was a very influential work, a theory of sound from a notable British gentleman that many of you know, and this was Lord Rayleigh. And Lord Rayleigh actually studied such phenomena of strings and organ pipes systematically, and he in particular investigated how does the number of overtones in such organ pipes grow with the frequency? And he found out that there's actually a very nice law which shows that the number of overtones grows with the volume of an organ pipe, so the volume of air, and with the um, frequency cubed. And uh, several years later, he realized that this sort of analysis that developed, uh, he developed for studying sound problems, he could actually also uh, apply to heat radiation. This led him, as you all know, to the famous uh, Rayleigh Gene's law, that is sort of one of the founding pillars of black body radiation. And here you have sort of exactly this law now stated as a function of the density of states. That's why there's not a new uh, to the cube, but the new squared there, because it's a density. And if you divide it by the volume, you get something that has this universal form but that was actually developed just for a cube in 3D. And there were actually a gentleman like Sommerfeld and Lorenz who pointed out that if we are supposed to use this law, then it must be provable that this law doesn't just apply to a cube, but it actually must be ap applicable to any geometry. And this is the problem that they gave to Weil, and Weil was in the audience when they posed this problem, and he proved rigorously as a mat mathematician that indeed, sort of the number of modes in 2D and in 3D, in the density of states, is indeed independent of the geometry. So whether this is a cube or a sphere or other any other geometrical shape, he could prove, and there have been many uh, people working on this while law since then, that sort of the density of states is really something geometry independent. So you can apply it to all different kinds of uh, uh, black bodies of different shape, and actually not only to those uh, black bodies and cavities that are hollow in the middle, but you can even apply it to disordered media, and this is the topic that I'm going to talk about today. What makes this disordered media special is actually that light rays that enter, they don't just scatter off the boundaries, but they scatter everywhere, so they have a very irregular shape inside. And this is what makes these materials opaque, so you typically cannot see through them, like this canvas here is white because of the scattering of light in, this, uh, in those materials. I will show you now a very, very oversimplified representation of what happens to light rays in such a disordered medium. This was again developed by two French uh, mathematicians who didn't even think of light, but they just thought about a random walk. And they had the following problem. They said, let's have a bounded domain with a circumference C in area A. And let's assume that we make a random walk through this domain. Let's, for example, take an ant that makes a random walk. Well, ants actually don't do random walks, but let's assume it's a drunken ant that really makes a random walk. And then they studied this from the random walk picture. And they said, let's assume that ants come actually from all sides, so isotropic and from all sides, and they enter this domain. What would be the average length of the path that those ants take when they go through this domain? And they came to the conclusion that actually the average length is actually a very nice um, geometrical, uh, has a very nice geometrical relationship. It's just pi, the area divided by the circumference or the average time is the same, only that you have here velocity here and down there. And in 3D, the same thing holds, only that you have a factor of four, not a factor of pi. 
And you can ask yourself, okay, well, why not? Probably mathematicians can prove this, but why should this be interesting? Well, it is very interesting, this relationship, and very counterintuitive, because there's one essential quantity about the random walk missing in this relation. And this is actually the mean free path. This relation, the average length, is independent of the step size that you take in your random walk. So if we stick, stick with the example of ants, there are large ants and there are small ants, and those large ants, they can make small, uh, large steps, but the small ants, they will make very small steps. And how can it be that the average length for both, for all of those ants is the same? Small ants, they can take a very short path, they will enter and they will exit. So you should think small ants have a very much shortened uh, path inside this domain. But on the other hand, the small ants, well, once they're inside, they get trapped, they get have very intricate path, and they will also have very long length. And that's the story of this relationship that sort of there's a sort of a balance. If you have a very short mean free path, then you have also very short length between exiting and entering and exiting, but you on the other hand also have very short long length, and those exactly compensate such that this relation ex actually holds. And the question that we asked ourselves together with uh, colleagues in France is whether such a relationship doesn't just hold for particles that do a random walk, but whether such a relationship can also be proven for light, especially for radiation that is isotropic and uniform, such as black body radiation. The question is, if we have black body radiation impinging on a disordered medium, can we also prove that the average time is actually independent of whether a medium is opaque, transparent, scattering, or not? And this is the question that we asked. And for this, we had to determine what is the average time that the light field spends inside the medium. And to calculate the average time, well, you need something uh, to do that. And there's a very convenient tool that was developed by uh, Eugene Wigner and Leonid Eisenbud at Princeton and generalized to multi-channel scattering problems by Felix Smith. It's the so-called Wigner-Smith or eisenbud wigner smith time delay operator. It's a matrix. It is built up of the scattering matrix. The scattering matrix is just a matrix that connects all incoming states to all outgoing states. By the way, it can minimally be me measured. And once you have it, and you can take its frequency derivative, you get access to the conjugate quantity to the frequency, which is the time. This operator has very nice properties. Uh, if the scattering matrix is unitary, it's emission, so it has real eigenvalues, the so-called proper delay times. It has orthogonal eigenstates, the so-called principal modes, and it gives you access to time without having to know anything about what's inside the system. You just need the far field information in the scattering matrix. Okay, let's try to use this operator now to estimate the time. Well, if I have isotropic illumination, it means light comes in from all possible modes. This is equivalent to taking the trace of this time delay operator. And it has been shown by a Soviet scientist many, many years ago that the trace of the time delay operator is exactly proportional to the density of states in a medium. And if now I take the Weyl law for estimating this density of states, which I've already shown before, I take this relation, that's now the density of states in 2D, not in 3D, this is why there's no square. I plug that in, then I get the relation, and the average time is the trace, so all modes divided by the number of modes. I put that in, and then I get exactly the relation that mathematicians have been proving for a random walk. I get this now for waves also. The scattering matrix connects incoming and outgoing waves, including all the interferences, and apparently this relation shows that the mean path length invariance, or this invariant time, also holds for waves. So if I take that seriously, this would mean that let's take a glass of water, and I have light rays going through that, and I measure what's the average length of those light rays, and the average length in such a glass of water is the same as the average path length in the turbid glass of water, because this relation, again, is independent of the mean free path. The way this works is, again, the same. Here, for the, tur for the turbid glass of water, you have light rays that are very short because they don't even enter very much into the medium. But due to scattering, you have other paths that are much longer. But on average, they give you exactly 
the same path length as in the completely transparent Gleisen 40. Before I show you experimental results on this, let me show you some numerical simulations. In the numerics that we did in our group, we considered just a simple waveguide. And let's first of all take an infinite mean free path, so an empty waveguide. And when you calculate the average time in such an empty waveguide, you see that you get very strong oscillations because whenever a new mode opens up in the waveguide, you get an increase in the density of states. This is because of such creeping modes that are very slow. But if you average over a certain frequency interval, you get the black curve, which is exactly described by the while law. So it really works very, very well. And we put in some scatterers to make the situation more complicated. The blue curve shows the average time that waves spend when they are transmitted. The red curve shows the average time when waves are reflected. If you average over both of them, you get the black curve. And it's again very well described by the while law. So in the numerics, this comes out really, really well. And we said, okay, let's do something crazy. We put many, many, many more scatterers such that the waves even enter the localized regime. Where's Robin? I hope he's listening. So when you enter the localized regime, finally we saw a deviation from the while law. So we do the same averaging, we get the black curve. And this does not fall on the curve of the while law. So we thought either there's something wrong in the numerics or there's indeed some mysterious uh, localization effect that we need to understand, or there's something else. And we found out that 110 years ago, Hermann Weil already proposed a correction factor to his Weil law. <laughs> and if we include the correction factor, well, <laughs> it's again very well described. What's the correction factor actually? So Hermann Weil understood and he postulated this, this was a hypothesis, he didn't prove it first, he said, okay, if, and let's look at one specific scatterer here, we make a zoom. This is the scatterer, and we assume it has directly boundary conditions. Then the wave that scatters by the scatterer, it has to go to zero at the boundary of the scatterer. And because of the fact that the wave has to go to zero, it cannot approach the scatterer sort of infinitely sharply, but there is sort of an exclusion volume around each scatterer. This is the test size of about lambda half. And because of that, the area that is accessible by the waves is reduced by this exclusion volume around each scatterer. And because we have so many scatterers, this exclusion volume adds up. And this sort of is exactly sees the circumference of each scatterer. If, if you sum that up, you get a sizable uh, correction. And this is why the Y law is modified. It's the first order correction term. And by the way, if you have Neumann boundary condition, then you have an increased density of states another reduced density of states in this, you know, can also be shown. So we saw this in numerics. I'll come back to that later. And then we teamed up with um, the team of Sylvain Gigant in Paris uh, at LKB and his postdoc Romulo Savo to measure this effect um, experimentally. And indeed, they took a glass of water, had some microbeads inside that were moving. Uh, they uh, directed a laser light sheet on this thing. And then they, uh, very well understood that the longer a light ray stays inside this liquid, the more it will be affected by the movement of those microparticles and the faster a speckle pattern will move. So if you record the speckle pattern and you do the autocorrelation function, which actually shows how fast the particles move and indirectly how long the light rays stay inside, you can estimate very well how long the light rays, uh, the light fields are inside, and you need to measure this from every angle. And if you do that for different liquids with just very few microparticles and very many, ranging from transparent to completely opaque, they showed that indeed for all those liquids, the average time or the average length that your radiation, which is here at a single frequency, but of course it works also for black body radiation, is really independent of the mean free path. It's actually really quite a uh, surprising result. Again, in this liquid, much of the radiation is directly back reflected. It doesn't even enter a lot. But those rays that enter, they get trapped for a long time. And on average, it's the same mean free path. Uh, so not the same mean free path, but the same mean path length. These are two different things. OK, good. So uh, I will co continue by telling you uh, about um, 
more about this operator. I've told you that when you take a frequency derivative, you have a time delay operator. But we recently realized that you can also take derivatives of the scattering matrix with respect to another parameter, another system parameter alpha. And in the same way as taking the, the derivative with respect to frequency gives you time, here if you take the derivative, for example, uh, with respect to some position, you can, this operator here gives you access to the conjugate quantity of position, which would then be the momentum principle. Or if you take the derivative with respect to an angle, then the conjugate quantity will be the angular momentum. The question is only which momentum and which angular momentum are we talking about here. As I will show you now, for example, let's assume we have some kind of an object, think of a microparticle of a certain shape. You measure the scattering matrix, for example, if this uh, microparticle is in a waveguide or somewhere else, and then you, you turn the, the particle a little bit, such that you can take the derivative with respect to the angle, then this operator will give you access to the angular momentum that the corresponding eigenstates of this operator couple to and transfer to this, um, to this object. In other words, for example, if we inject an eigenstate of this operator after measuring this, and this was done in the group of Ulrich Kuhl and Mies, um, with the maximum uh, eigenstate, then we get the state that actually transfers the maximum angular momentum onto this particle. This is actually an experimental measurement, which means that it couples to the particle at the point of maximum lever where you can most efficiently turn this particle in one direction. You can also demand that you actually have a symmetric excitation that you couple here and there, such that you have only rotation and no linear momentum here. Okay, so, um, and now I want to make, uh, show one slide about something that was completely surprising to us, which is a work that we did recently together with uh, Lukas Rachbauer, Dorian Boucher, um, Ulf Leonhardt from the Weizmann, and uh, oh, myself, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and we asked the question, what happens if we do not just take classical light fields, as we did so far, but actually we quantize the light field? We, uh, we assume that the light field is really a quantum electrodynamical field. And um, in the same way as the scattering matrix, then due to scattering transfers an incoming field to an outgoing field, in quantum mechanics you can define an evolution operator. Um, and this evolution operator should then satisfy the following relation that was actually derived by Ulf uh, some years ago. And if you, um, if you, uh, start with this relation, you can also then define a Wigner smith operator um, that doesn't just um, contain information about classical scattering, but actually about the full quantum scattering problem. And the only difference is that you don't have the scattering matrix here, but you have this evolution operator that is uniquely determined by the scattering matrix, by the classical scattering matrix that you can measure. And if you do this, and you start out with this quantum Wigner smith operator, and um, you can write it down just based on classically accessible uh, Wigner Smith operators based on the classical scattering matrix. It turns out that this quantum Wigner Smith operator from the, for the quantum electrodynamical field looks exactly the same as the classical one, just you have your A dagger and A terms here. The only difference is that you get some trace term here where we originally thought, okay, hmm, what could that be? Seems irrelevant. Why don't we throw it away? But then at the second look, together with Ulf, and we looked at this the term together, they told us that this term has a very special meaning. In particular, it turns out that if you take the vacuum expectation value of this operator, where you don't send anything inside your medium, you will still be able to transfer a torque or a force, but not due to the uh, amplitude that you send in, but due to this remaining term that is also there if you send nothing in. So apparently, this is a term that transfers a force or torque or whatever, even in the vacuum. So it's clear it must be a Casimir term. That's what it is. This is a Casimir term, and this Casimir term is uniquely determined just by the scattering matrix in the far field. 
you can ask yourself, how can the scattering matrix that you measure in the far field, we don't have any near field information, how does this classical scattering matrix know about the Casimir forces inside the system? How is this possible? Well, the reason why this works is because the <laughs> scattering matrix, as I showed you before, knows about the density of states. And I told you that in the while law, for example, if you have two scatterers that are nearby, you have this exclusion volume around the scatterers if, if you have Dirichlet boundary conditions. If you bring those two scatterers now close together, the exclusion volume is not anymore twice the exclusion volume of one scatterer, but because they overlap those exclusion volumes, the exclusion volume will be smaller, meaning the density of states will be larger when you bring the two particles together as well with respect to the fact when they are apart. And this is, this means that the density of states changes depending on whether you bring particles closer together or not. And this is exactly the origin of the, of the Casimir forces. Uh, and depending on whether you have Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions, they will be um, repulsive or attractive. And this is something that we are currently very excited about and um, and we hope to have a paper out on this very soon. Okay, uh, another slide that I want to present here, another interesting connection of this Wigner smith operator is to information theory. You can ask the question, let's say you have a particle somewhere and you want to measure the position of this particle very precisely, which is a common problem, for example, in metrology. You can ask the question, does it actually make a difference if this particle is in free space or if it's embedded, embedded in a complicated environment. And typically you, you would think, if you embed a particle into a complex scattering environment like a disordered medium, of course you will not be able to get the same amount of information about this particle and therefore also not be able to measure its position as precisely as here. But that's not true. Okay, I'll try to be fast. And um, one of the most fundamental relations in this, in this business is the so-called Kramer-Rau bound, which tells, you is, which tells you that the more precisely you want to estimate a parameter, like the position of this particle, um, the more information you need to have on this particle, and, and this um, variation in the measurement is exactly uh, bounded by the inverse of the Fisher information. So we asked ourselves, can you also express the Fisher information which is the central quantity in metrology um, through the scattering matrix? And the answer is yes, you can. This was done with Dorian Boucher and Alad Mosk. And it turns out that not only can you do that, again, with the derivative of the scattering matrix, but the Fisher information operator that you get is then four times the Wigner Smith operator that, you in, that I introduced earlier. And the fact that sort of particle manipulation and informi information retrieval are int intimately linked. This is not a coincidence, but this is actually uh, a consequence of, the, um, of Heisenberg's uncertain uncertainty principle. And if you do the math and you ask yourself, what's the average information you can get on a parameter theta? Uh, this is given by the trace of this operator. The trace can be shown to be related to the uh, expectation value of the den local density of state squared. And the local density of, square density of states in such a medium is again independent of whether there's sort of a scattering env environment around or not, apart from those so-called C0 speckle correlations that people in the experiment have also been measuring. So the answer is, to make a long story short, we can prove in this paper that uh, whether a particle is embedded in free space or in a strongly scattering environment does not matter at all in the sense of that in both cases you get the same average estimation preci uh, precision about the parameter theta, like the position, the refractive index, the angular orientation of a particle, independent of whether it's in free space or in a disordered environment. Okay? So with this, I want to acknowledge um, the help and collaboration of many people, in particular uh, the groups in France, Rémi Caminati, Sylvain Gigant, Romain Pirard, Ram Romulo Savo, Philippe Ambrichli and uh, Alexander Haber. And these were the people uh, involved in the second part of the talk, Lukas Rachba on the quantum Wigner smith operator, Michi Horodinsky, Dorian Boucher uh, from France, Alad from Utrecht, Ulf from Weizmann, Jan from London, Mathieu Davy, 
uh, from Ren and Ulrich from Nice. And before I conclude, one last slide as a teaser. I didn't have enough time to talk about it. But since we're here on a workshop on black body radiation, where the central object is actually a black body, and the black body is a, is a body that can absorb incoming radiation perfectly. Most bodies don't absorb radiation perfectly, but I will show you two concepts, how you can make a body that doesn't absorb perfectly, how you can turn it into a perfect absorber. Very short, just one slide. So let's assume you have a disordered medium, and if you shine uh, waves onto it, typically this disordered medium transmits a part and reflects a part. Let's assume here this is a perfectly abs absorbing screen. So how could, you, how could you couple the incoming radiation coming from all angles perfectly to this absorbing screen? The solution that we found together with Mathieu, Davi, and Ren is actually similar to what you have on your glasses in anti-reflection coating. And we showed that there is actually a way to design an anti-reflection coating for a disordered medium. You put a suitably designed medium in front of a, another disordered medium such that for all incoming angles at the right frequency, there's no reflection, everything gets perfectly transmitted, and you make such a scattering medium into a perfect absorber at this frequency. Another reason why a medium doesn't perfectly absorb is because it's just a weak absorber. Let's take a thin film uh, that just absorbs part of the light that passes through, and usually if you want to increase the absorption, you put it in a cavity. The cavity, however, has the problem that if you come in with a beam, well, part of it will be absorbed, but part of it will be already be back reflected before even entering the cavity. The solution we found to kill any back reflection is to actually embed this absorber into a so-called degenerate 4F cavity, where sort of the light beam that gets back reflected gets perfectly canceled by the uh, beam that enters the cavity and then destructively inter interferes with the outgoing beam. And this works for any incoming angles and makes out of every weak absorber a coherent, perfect absorber for any incoming wavefronts. Okay, I see that Mr. Chairman is already there. It's time to conclude, and this is a picture of my group, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.